so the body would something else but God gives it a body just as he wished and to each of the seeds a body of its own all flesh is not the same flesh but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beast and another flesh of birds and another of fish there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from stars in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body, if there is a natural body. There is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not the first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, the earthly. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, so also are those who are earthly. As is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word this evening. It's a lengthy passage this evening, but man, is it a rich passage tonight as we look to tackle the subject of the resurrected body. We need your help. These things are hard to understand. They are difficult to comprehend and to get our minds and our hearts around. But Lord, we we look to you for that help. It's your book. We need you to break it open for us this evening. And Lord, we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Well, as we uh, look to answer questions, I'll tell you, I had two most popular questions that were asked. One is, um, what kind of body are we going to have? What are we going to be able to do? Are we going to do neat things like teleport and stuff like that? Or what, what kind of body, you know, how are we, are we all going to have one language? And how are we, just how are things going to work? What kind of a body, um, what's the nature of a heavenly glorified body um, that, that's going to be? And the other one is, what are we going to do for eternity? Um, is it just going to be one really, really long worship service? Or is there going to be other neat things to do? And so... Um, we'll save that one, and we're going to look at what we're going to do. The, the one, what we're going to do is really interesting, as is all of it. But tonight, uh, we're going to start to look at, and I don't know if we'll get through it all or not, but um, what kind of body are we going to have? Let me just ask you this. Are you getting tired of yours? Oh, <laughs> there you <there>, there. <laughs> You know, my... You ask that question, and people automatically go, yes, 
Exactly. I'm ready for a trade-in already, right? It's like taking the old car with too many miles on it, and it's a clunker now, and it's just something's always going wrong. It's nickel and diming you to death. You know that kind of car. You've probably had that kind of car, right? The one that every time you turn around is having to go to the mechanic, spell that doctor, right? And having to get something tuned up, changed up, replaced, uh, whatever to it. And they're, they're just like, yes, I want a new body then. And I have uh, news for you tonight. Uh, you're not getting one. I, I, I didn't say it was good news. Um, you're not getting a new body. You're getting a transformed body. You're going to keep your body, right? You're, God's not changing you uh, into, God, let me just say this, nobody is, cha- God's not changing your wife into Cheryl Ladd or in your husband into George Clooney, all right? None of that is going to happen, all right? All right? You are going to stay you for all of eternity. That's what he says. And this question is not new. I started at verse 35 just so you could get that one thing there. That's exactly the question Paul is answering. What kind of a body are we going to have in the resurrection? Maybe because it's lengthy, you you didn't remember the very first verse, verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? His answer begins uh, with a bit of a hot mess in verse 36 because it's, you fool. Let me just clean that up for him for just a minute here. Um, He's not talking personally directly to you on that, all right? So nobody get a, well, Paul shouldn't be calling me a fool because I'm asking that. Paul's talking to the Corinthians who he knows what they have been taught. He lived at that church longer than anywhere else, right? I mean, between there and Ephesus, the two longest pastorates he had there, and he sends them at least three to four letters that we know of that he sends them. And so he knows their teaching, he knows their doctrine, he knows who's pastoring them when he leaves, he knows what they were founded on, the gospel they were founded on. And now they want to come up and say, well, tell me again, what kind of body are we going to get? And he goes, ah, you weren't listening type of thing, right? And he says, Listen, and he goes through this whole thing then that starts with from farmers planting seeds uh, and uh, what they plant is not what they harvest. There's going to be a change, but the change comes from the seed that's planted. So he says, whether you plant grain, you're going, if you plant a grain of seed, guess what? You're going to harvest wheat. All right. If you're going to plant an oak tree, you guess what? If you plant an acorn, guess what you get? Yeah, you're not getting an apple tree out of an acorn, right? You're getting what you sow. And when your body goes into the grave, guess what's coming out? A transformed that same body, not, not something else. No, we don't get wings. Uh, we don't get, uh, right, just it's the same body is what he's trying to say just in that passage there of what, what you sow is what's coming up. What's going down is what's coming up, but it will be changed. It will not be something new as in different. It will be transformed is what he's trying to say. We will all, he repeats it, we will all be changed. And then in the twinkling of an eye. So there's some important things that he reaffirms just in this passage. And and one of those is that life after life starts at separation of the soul and the spirit in the body, right? He says to be present, uh, he says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, um, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's what he's saying here. It's going to be changed, but it's got to be resurrected first, right? 
There's no in-between ground. There's no soul sleep. There's no slumbering, and there's just no waiting for the resurrection. No, no. You're going to be present with the Lord immediately, but until the rapture of the church, if you die before the rapture, there's a period of time you're going to be in a disembodied state. All right, you will be a disembodied spirit in heaven. That's the first kind of body. Remember, heaven is in two phases. The first phase is where we go right now prior to the rapture of the church, prior to the millennial reign of Christ and all of that. Prior to the new heavens and new earth, there is another heaven that we're going to. There is the present heaven we're going to, the permanent abode of God and all of his angels that are serving him now. And you will be there there in a disembodied state. Now, I don't want you to get all worried about that, all right, because it's going to look and, and feel suspiciously like you have a body, all right? You'll be able to see other people. You'll be able to hear other people. You'll be able to have conversations. You will see them there, all right? Um, and he's affirming that the disembodied state is also a short-term thing. That's what he's really, that's really the gist of what he's getting here um, in chapter 15 is that it, this is a short-term thing. There's going to be a resurrection. There is, that day is coming. And then he goes through the whole thing of the trumpet is going to sound, and the dead are going to rise first, right? The, you've heard that. If you've sung, changed in the twinkling of an eye, right? The trump of God will sound and the dead will rise. That is going to be resurrection day for everyone who is dead in Christ there, right? So your body is going to be resurrected there. First, the spirit gone, gone at the moment of death prior to the rapture. And then you have the rapture of the church, so this leads us to an interesting point because at the rapture of the church, your body is resurrected, but you're not coming back to earth then. In fact, it's going to be a fairly long time that you're in the body before you come back to the earth. I don't know if you've thought about that or not um, because immediately after the rapture, right, you have at, at least seven years of tribulation, right? So your transformed body um, you're already going to be in seven years there. And then you have what? You have the second coming of Christ where he sets up his kingdom, but he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years, right? And then after that, so now you're up to a thousand and seven years of your body already, your transformed body already. And then after that, Satan is loose for we don't know how long. He says for a short period. We don't know how long that's going to be, right? At, at which he can go and deceive the nations again. And then there's the final battle. And then after the final battle, the great white throne judgment. And then you have the new heavens and the new earth coming down, the chronology of the Bible. So all this taken together is... Uh, you are a thousand years in your new body before you ever inhabit the new earth. And some of you think 80 is old, right? Some of you think 55 and cruising is just for old people, right? Uh, uh, but but it, it is a transformed body. It's a tra so it won't age the same way, right? Um. So what it, you, you realize right now God's already got this sort of resurrection thing in a prelude form in your body already? Let me give you an example. You know how fast you grow an entire new body of skin? No, 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 no. Seven years, Lord, n never that, that old. A, a baby replaces all of its skin every 14 days. And it's because of the way that DNA and the particles and the cells die and replace each other, They're, you're constantly losing particles and gaining particles by cell replication in your body. It's not just your skin. It's throughout just about every part of your body with just a very few exceptions there. Um, but all a baby replaces the entire body of skin every 14 days. Teenagers, every 28 days. 
they replace all of their skin every, every 28 days. Young adults, um, 28 to 42, um, it, 20, 28 dollars every 42 days, all right? Um, if you're in 55 and cruising, it goes up to 84 days, all right? But still, under three months, all of your skin is replaced every single quarter every quarter you basically get three bodies of or four bodies of skin every single year then now that just doesn't go for skin that's just about every part of your body with very few exceptions there's portions of your brain that do not replace except now they think that it, some areas of the place that's responsible for memory can be regrown and tooth enamel doesn't regrow, which is why your dentist is always saying, can I put some of that, yeah, glue on there, or whatever it is, the stuff that tastes like glue, whenever that fluoride, I think it is, is it fluoride that they put it on and then your inside of your lips stick to your teeth for a couple of hours and they tell you don't do any, you know, hot water, hot anything or eat something crunchy because you'll, you know, I don't know, scrape it up and cut your gums up. I don't know what it does. But, but there's this part that God's already sort of ain't re, got in place where things are already renewing all the time, and yet you always look like you. That's the point. Is every 90 days you have a full set of skin, and every 90 days you still look the same. Why? Because that's the way God made you. And he's not changing that. He liked you the way he made you, and now he's going to keep that form all of eternity. That's why you won't go up and say, I don't recognize anybody here. Because they all look the same, or they all look completely different, or anything. No, you're going to recognize your loved one. It's one of the major questions that people have about the body is, will I recognize my loved ones? Well, yes, you're going to recognize your loved ones, and they're going to look better than they ever looked before. They're going to look fantastic when you see them the next time over in the glory land. They're going to have a transformed body. They will look the best they have ever looked in their entire life and as good as they will ever look. And as good as they will ever look because they will have a glorified, transformed body no longer will you ever go to a class reunion and say, I don't recognize anybody here, right? That's never going to happen again. So what does Paul teach in this passage here? I'm going to go just a couple of things to be brought out here. The first thing he says is that they're going to be real bodies. That's the first thing that he teaches here. They're going to be real bodies. They're going to be flesh and blood bodies, all right? Flesh and bones. People, are you going to have, I, I read this question here. Are we going to have blood in our bodies? Yeah. You know why? You're going to have a heart. Something for it to pump. There's going to be blood coursing through your veins. There's going to be lungs, and they're going to breathe. And all of these things are, you know why? Because it is integral to what it means to be human. That's what it is. You're not transforming into something non-human to say, oh, he doesn't need a heart, doesn't need lungs, doesn't need any of that, doesn't need any of that. Uh, would be to change you into something not human anymore. And that's not what the Bible teaches. You're going to be the same human up there that you are here, but with a transformed body then, a renewed body. Not a changed uh, as in a brand new, I've never seen this before type of body. No, it's you up there with your body up there so yeah there's going to be blood in your veins there's going to be sinew there's going to be cartilage there's going to be flesh and bones and all of that stuff that makes up your body right now you're still going to have it when you get up there in fact 
Jesus proves this point after the resurrection when he comes into the disciples there and he says, look, it's me. A spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see I have. That's what Jesus says in Luke 24, 19. A spirit does not have flesh and bones like I have. And what did he have? He had a transform, he had a glorified, resurrected body. He wasn't just a resurrected spirit. It was his body. That's why the tomb was empty. He had a resurrected body, a glorified body then. He said, look it, it's me, touch me, feel me. He told Thomas, put your hands, uh, rear fingers in the nail prints, put your hand in my side. What is he proving? That he had, that the resurrected body is a real body, just like he had before. As a matter of fact, so real that they, they didn't even recognize him at first, and then suddenly they say, oh my gosh, that is him. It's the Lord. That's what I mean by it'll look better than it's ever looked. It'll be glorified. And, and then, but there were certain times where Jesus just purposely hid himself from them. So Jesus teaches that our body not new, they are transformed, they're changed. But they will be different. They're going to be different and. Uh, than, than they are now. Um, here's some ways that Paul says just immediately that they're going to be different. Uh, one is that they're going to be imperishable. He says they're buried perishable. They're going to be raised imperishable. And what he's saying is the body that you have now is subject to decay right? The body you have now is subject to decay. You know that. The, 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 listen, the older you get, the more you know it, right? It's the young people think they're bulletproof and nothing ever bad's going to happen to them, right? That, sure, I can jump off this and nothing possibly could go wrong, right? It's the mom who's standing, the grandmother especially, is saying, you dummy, don't do that. You're going to break your leg. And all of the, no, nothing. what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, because this body is subject to decay, right? That's why um, plastic surgeons make so much money. That's why all of their boats are paid for and their kids have paid for college. Why? Because somebody is always going to them saying, <laughs> turns out I'm subject to decay and I would like this changed or that tucked or that bent or that straightened or that just flat out removed. Your net, you know there will be no plastic surgeons in heaven. In fact, there'll be no doctors. There'll be no chiropractors. There'll be no dentists. There'll be nobody that treat what is ultimately just the decay of the human body. Because there will be no decay. Ever. It's imperishable. What Revelation 21 tells us is that heaven is the land of no's, right? There's going to be no pain. There's going to be no crying. There's going to be no mourning. There's going to be no tears. Why? Because there's going to be no sin. There'll be no sin. And when you remove sin out of the equation, what do you have? Well, we're all the way back to the Garden of Eden, aren't we? Where Adam and Eve were really meant to live forever. What's that mean? It means they weren't subject to decay at first. And the Lord would come down and walk with them in the cool of the day. Why would they walk? Because they had real bodies. They, Adam and Eve had real bodies. But they're going to be imperishable. Never, ever, ever, ever will there be a tummy ache in heaven. There'll never be a toothache. Nothing. Don't, all the optometrists are going to be out of business. 
Every near-death experience I, I read, they talk about how great the eyesight is, that they can see as far or as near, and it's all in perfect focus. They can see details they've never seen before in their life. That, that it's not just here across the street or, you know what, pilots use, well, we have a 10-mile road. No, it's as far as they want to see. And it's all in perfect focus there, all the way up to the very, very near because they, it's imperishable. The second thing that he says is this, that dishonor versus glory, that it is, uh, when it goes down there, it's in dishonor, and when it comes up, it's in glory. What does that mean? Well, dishonor is really like disgrace. You know, there's, there's some things you just don't like to show, right, <laughs> yourself. No, uh, I mean, there are... It's getting less and less nowadays. <laughs> you know, I will say this, that, that um, it's getting less and less nowadays of parts that you don't really want to show. Just go to the beach anytime, and it doesn't seem like, oh, my, my word. But it's sown in discretion. What it means to be raised in glory, though, is splendor. Let me just tell you, when you read glory, read splendor. When your body comes up out of that grave and you are reunited with your spirit, with your soul in heaven, the radiance and the glory and the splendor is going to be like nothing you've ever seen, but you're still going to be you. It's really hard to get your mind around because we see splendor and we think, uh, you know, we see glory and we think ration. Well, wait a minute. There were two other people within that splendor. And it was Moses and it was Elijah. Splendor as well. It's not like they were off to the side in the shadows. They were there and they had these resurrected bodies. It was splendor on display. With Christ, it was majesty as well. But they had splendor, this light, this radiance that just flowed. Uh, when you read these near-death experiences, what they talk about is all the light that's just shining through people. All the light beams that are just shining uh, through people. And yet it, it's so bright and yet it doesn't hurt your eyes. So what Paul's saying here is it's going to be is sown in disgrace, uh, sown in dishonor. But when it comes up, it's going to be something to look at. You are going to be something to look at. There will never be anybody coming up to you in heaven and saying, bad hair day, huh? <laughs> never going to happen, Right? Every single day is going to be your best hair day, right? Everything You don't have to worry about the humidity saying, it's just this curls. I just I don't even know why. We walked out this morning coming to church. We left the house just 7 o'clock what we normally do, and my wife walks out of the house, and it had to be like, I don't know, 156% humidity out this morning. And as soon as we walked out, my wife looks at me and she goes, I don't even know why we bother to take a shower. Because you're just, right? As soon as you walk in and you take about three breaths, you're breathing water. And then you get in the car and now you're sitting in it. Because all you've done is gone outside and breathed. None of that is going to happen in heaven, right? It's going to be splendor, your body splendor is what he is what he says i also like to think weakness he says weakness that it's sown in weakness but it's going to be raised in power this is probably a lot of 
some people's favorite thing here because weakness is this want of strength. It's why you get tired, uh, right? You just work a normal day and you come home and you're like, I'm exhausted. Or you're arguing with somebody who's just like, it just sucks everything out of me. And I just, all of these things, right? Uh, it's just every day is just a toil and you're coming home and, and you're just, I'm ready to go to bed. But it's... I haven't watched the six o'clock news yet, and you know, I'm ready for at least a nap beforehand. I, it's just every day, and your body just seems to wear down, and the clock gets shorter and shorter every single day, right? And then you do a lot of those days in a row, and then it's just, I gotta, I, I just crash for a day to try to regain what? Regain your strength, right? Not there. It says when that body comes up, it's going to be raised in power. That word dudamis, it's where we get our word dynamite from. It's uh, really a lot of times in scripture, it's, it's inherent power. It's strength. It's power to do miracles. The fact that what you consider a miracle here is going to be next. Right? What would be considered a miracle here is going to be at now. Everybody's going to be doing it. Why? Because their bodies are raised with this power then. They're not lacking any kind of strength. They're not lacking any kind of fortitude. They have this inherent strength that is within them because God has transformed body. It also refers to moral strength and moral power. And this strength is sold to be able to resist temptation. There'll be no falling to temptation in heaven. Why? Because you're going to have moral power as well as physical power. What's sown in weakness be raised in power. It's like you get to be your own superhero. Except that everybody's a superhero, so you're just normal there. So it kind of takes the, you know, the novelty out because everybody's one, right? It's like living in a superhero village. But that's really what he's talking about is what's sown in weakness. It's going to be raised with this dynamic power that he's talking about here. And then the last thing he says is what's natural versus what's spiritual. What's natural, he says it's so natural, but when it comes up, it's spiritual. Well, that's kind of confusing because we just said you're going to have a body and you're going to have bones and ligaments and, and all of this stuff that makes you in blood and, and your brain and all of this kind of stuff. So what makes it kind of, um, how's it spiritual then? Well, what he's talking about is your body right now is dominated by fleshly desires. All right? By fleshly desires is what your body is dominated by. It's why my bodily, my body constantly craves, you know, the next oatmeal cookie. Because it's craving it. It's a, it, that's, that's right. I ate the last one on the way to church tonight. It's a good thing I picked up a box of zebra cakes on the way home this afternoon. <laughs> prior, prior planning prevents poor performance, so. Yep, I got that box of zebra cakes. <laughs> so, but listen, but now it's going to be a body dominated by the Spirit of God. Did you get that? Where we're all this life, you struggle through this life because you've had a body that has been dominated by fleshly desires, and you've had to struggle against those things in your life. Every, why, well, bad, listen, everybody still sins. Why? Because they still struggle with fleshly desires. There's not a single soul alive who can say, got that beat, right? Not a problem here. Christian perfection, put it over the door, right? No, none of that is happening right now. Good teaching, but hard to follow through on. I'll tell you, right? Charles Wesley wrote a book called Christian Perfection. It's only about this big. Still can't do it. 
And it's only about this tall. It's on my bookshelf, right? So think if he wrote a book like this that said Christian perfection, no chance, right? But that's the problem with life is you have a body that's dominated by fleshly desires. But when your body is raised, you and I nor any other Christian will ever have a problem with that again. Your body will be dominated by the indwelling Spirit of God. Forever by the Spirit. Forever by the Just think about that. Listen. You're going to have a really cool body. You're going to be able to eat. There's going to be eating in heaven. Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God. It's what a great joy. Yes. Oh, so happy about that. Yes, there is. I mean, one of the main suppers you get to go to is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus said at the Last Supper, what? I'm not going to eat or drink of this again until what? I do it again with you in the kingdom of heaven, right? There's going to be eating in heaven. You're going to be on a new earth. There's going to be all kinds of food, and the calories won't count. You're going to be able to have all the chocolate you want and none of the diabetes. You know why? Because your body will be dominated by the Spirit of God. You'll always want just the right amount. Why? Because there's no sin. Guess what? No gluttony right? You'll always want just the right amount. You'll only need what you need. You'll eat what you need, and guess what? You will enjoy it, because there's going to be these feasts and fellowship and all of that. Fellow eating has always been, to the human race, always been part of fellowship. It's how we get together. It's how we bond with one another. We're going to be doing that for eternity, but you'll only have to eat just the right amount. You won't have to worry about it then. No scales in heaven. No, never going to be any weigh-ins. Going no Weight Watchers up there. Because you'll always want just the right amount of what you need. And it's going to be pleasurable. It's going to be food like you've never had before in your life. It's going to be sumptuous food and fair up there. You're going to I'll go back to knowing each other. I heard um, Ed Heinsohn was my professor at Liberty. He's the dean of the Divinity School now up at Liberty University. And he says, there is no way we're going to know less up there than we know here. Of course you're going to know other people. In fact, we get a little glimpse of that on the back on the Mount of Transfiguration when you got Peter, James, and John. And who do they see? Moses and Elijah. How long before them did they live? Yeah, they, they never saw them. They never got a Polaroid of them where they could kind of pick them out of a lineup, out of a crowd. They didn't know, and yet automatically, without introductions, Peter, Moses, James, Moses, Moses, Peter, all of that. No, none of that's happening here. And they just look at him and say, that's Moses and Elijah. And you know what else they hear? A language they didn't understand. <gasps> because Jesus and them are talking, or a language at least they didn't learn. Why? Because we already know 300, 350 years beforehand the Old Testament was translated into what? Greek. Moses and Elijah didn't speak Greek. They didn't speak Greek, but yet they're up there having this conversation, and they understand them. They hear them. They're listening to them. Jesus and them are having this conversation. And so people say, are we going to have a universal language? Yes. You know why? Because the only reason we don't now is because we messed up at the Tower of Babel. 
That's the only reason that we have division of languages now is so that God could put a stop to that nonsense down there. And so we change the languages around. There's going to be no need for division. In fact, there will be no division in heaven. Hence, there will be a universal language. What's it going to be? Well, English, obviously. Now, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't <laughs> I have no idea what the universal language, but I know this, we'll be able to communicate fully, not just with words, but the hearts and the intents of each other. There will be no hidden messages. There will be no hidden thoughts. There will be none of that. Everything will be out in the open. There'll be no hidden stuff going on up in heaven. The communication up there will be like none you've never, you're trying all the time saying, well, what did they really mean by, you'll know exactly what they mean by that because there'll be no hidden motivations and intentions and all of that. Listen, what we're getting ready to have, what age, okay, what age, let me just, there is a very common thing that everybody's gonna be 33 years old because Jesus died at 33. I know a lot of, that's a very popular number if you're 65. (laughs) Not so popular if you're 14, all right? I'm just saying that. But let me just tell you, nowhere in the Bible does it speak of sameness in heaven. That's not in the Bible. Sameness is not there. We'll all be individuals. And there's going to be some kind of time. I know we like to say there'll be no time. Of course there is. John says they stopped the worship for about 30 minutes. How do they know that? When to stop? In heaven, there's a time. How do they know when seven years is up? If they don't keep time in heaven, there'll be some kind of a time. But time will be different. Time's going to be different. And you're going to age, but you won't age. Because you're just going to keep going and you'll be keep renewed and transformed. Randy Alcorn, who wrote the book Heaven, said you'll age without aging. I love that thought. I love that thought. Because you know what? To be the same. Think of this. 33 for all of eternity. Sooner or later it gets boring. Right? Sooner or later, and the Bible doesn't teach that. There is no sameness. But what there is, is the ages keep rolling, and you're just as splendorous as you ever were. Because you accepted Jesus, and you were raised with an imperishable body. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this evening. Thank you. There's a lot to unpack there. There is an awful lot to unpack, but it's the hope that we have in you that when we get to heaven, it's going to be unlike anything we've ever thought about. I mean, we read these verses and we try to interpret and we try to do the best we can in the interpretation of it. and We try to make it make a little bit of sense. But, you know, I think there's no way we're going to be our first day on heaven and just looking around gobsmacked. Utterly surprised at the glory of heaven. At what you've done and what you've prepared for us.